All right, good morning to everybody. All right. I'm going to make sure that I've got this set right. Good morning and welcome to Faith Baptist Church. I'm Borden Scott and the lead pastor here. And before we begin our time of worship uh, today, it's our tradition to take a few minutes uh, prior, on the Sunday prior to Remembrance Day for a time of remembrance. And I've stressed a few times recently that followers of Jesus are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, first and foremost. And so our allegiance and our very identity are anchored in that. But for as long as we walk in this world, we are also citizens of various nations. And few are as fortunate as we are to live in a nation as peaceful and prosperous as Canada. For this, we give thanks. And we also seek to remember the biblical call for us to pray for our leaders, to love our neighbor, and to pursue justice in the land. One of the key responsibilities that the Bible tells us about is that God gives earthly governments the duty to restrain evil. And this has led Canada to, to war, to conduct peacekeeping and training missions around the world. And so today we show our appreciation for those who've served in some of these very difficult and dangerous ways in the hope of building a more peaceful and more stable world. We also acknowledge the terrible cost that can come with this service. Those who've lost their lives and the many others who have been physically or psychologically injured. We owe them far more than our thanks around Remembrance Day, and so may we also advocate for their proper ongoing care and support and be ready to offer community and love to them. Now I'd like to invite uh, Padre Art Crawley to come and lay our Remembrance Day wreath. In a moment, we'll show a video that's put together for this, which contains uh, the poem in Flanders Fields, the last post, uh, and a moment of silence, followed by the, uh, the Reveille and O Canada. And so we'll invite you to stand for that last post and moment of silence and uh, the parts that follow into O Canada. I'll remind you when we get there. Uh, after, a little later on as well, we'll also be placing for those who wish to, to place a poppy either in the Remembrance Day wreath or on the table in front. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable getting up into a crowd to do that, you can wait till the crowd subsides, or if that's not something you prefer to do this year, that's all right too, but we'll offer that opportunity toward the end of our time of remembrance. And so uh, we'll begin the, the video now, and I'll invite you to, to stand at the appropriate time if you feel able to do so. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow Between the crosses, row on row that mark our place And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly Scarce heard amid the guns below We are the dead Short days ago, we lived Felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith, with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Please stand if you feel able.
Well, thank you. Let us pray. Loving God, it is not always clear to us the ways in which you are at work in this messy world. Lord God, some of these, these struggles and these challenges, we have information from everywhere about all of the hard things that are happening, and there's very little in some cases it feels that we can do. Lord God, I pray that you would help us to trust in you as the sovereign one over all things, that you would remind us of the call to be faithful in prayer, knowing that this does make a difference, and that you would show to us those things that are near to us each, each one of us, that can be done to serve the, the purposes of, of peace and justice around us. Lord God, you, you give your people many ways in which to be a blessing to this world as the salt and light you called us to be, and make us mindful of these things today, I pray. Bless those who are suffering loss or who are struggling as a result of, of their service, and be with their families, Lord God, today, I pray. Strengthen them, give them hope for the future, find a way for them to receive the help that they, they might need. And Lord God, I pray that you would continue to fill them with, with purpose and a desire to do good around them. All this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to turn things over to our, our worship team now as we begin our, our regular service and time of worship. All right. This morning our call to worship comes from John 16, 31 to 33. You believe at last, Jesus answered, but a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Thanks, Andrew. Please stand as we sing 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Your rich in love and your slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time. Come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand 
thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never Nothing compares. 
For Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. For Thou, O Kids who've been very patient, it's time for Sunday school, so we invite you guys to head on across with your, your teachers for your Sunday school time. And there are a couple of announcements I'll, uh, I'll share as they make their way out. Uh, one is that we will figure out the new thermostat better next week so you won't be quite so chilly in here. <laughs> That'll be a high priority. Uh, next... Uh, Next week, we also, after church, or in the evening, sorry, at 7 o'clock tomorrow, or next Sunday night, November the 14th, is our, our semi-annual meeting. And so uh, we invite those who are members or who want to just know a little bit more to, to come. We'll have re, uh, reports given from our uh, active boards and, uh, and committees and leadership teams, and um, those can be just given from the floor, but then if you've got something on paper to give to the clerk after, then that's certainly appreciated. And... Uh, yeah, not a whole lot more to say about that other than that proof of vaccination is required for that event since it's not a regular uh, worship service. And so we'll uh, please remember to bring that if you're coming out because we'll have to check that uh, as people come in. That's, that's what the province wants us to do. And uh, we saw a little bit this week about why the province wants us to do that as well since um, those who are watching the briefing on Friday saw that quite a number of the recent surge in cases have come through a couple of different kinds of, uh, of religious gatherings where that was not done. And so uh, that reminds us about the importance of not being complacent in these things. Uh, November the 20th, the Saturday f uh, of the weekend after next, uh, we have a, a special speaker from the Nova Scotia uh, Treaty Education coming to talk about uh, treaties of peace and friendship and what reconciliation uh, means. And so uh, we've got some, we've sent out information this week and there's, uh, I believe, some pamphlets available for that one 
as well. And so we uh, invite you to come if you'd like at 9.30. Uh, it's nice if you can let the office know you're coming just so we have a sense of the numbers. We've invited those from other churches in our area and across the Halifax Baptist Association as well. And uh, just an opportunity to, to learn and, uh, and just deepen our understanding of some of these things. We also have our Christmas kickoff on November the 28th. We're looking forward to a fun day in here, getting our sanctuary ready for Christmas, and then to head across to the gym for some uh, crafts and activities and uh, opportunities to have food and fellowship together. So uh, mark that one on your calendar and plan to stay after. And I think uh, I'm going to ask Pam to come on up for a moment, and she's going to tell us about a couple of the Christmas projects we have to support our, our community. Good morning, everybody. The uh, first project I'll mention is uh, this year we're doing uh, a program with Salvation Army again. It's the Christmas Angel Tree, and it supports local families. And we uh, are given an age group from newborn to the age of 12. They're asking for toys rather than clothes as your gifts, unless they say there is an exception for hats and, and mittens, those type of things that get lost all the time, I guess. Uh, now, you don't wrap your gift because they're going to have to make sure that it is age appropriate and so on. So just bring the gift. The tree will be in the lobby next Sunday. So you take your tag from the tree, and it might say boy aged uh, 9 to 11. If that's the one you want, you take that, you buy the gift, you bring the gift back, unwrapped, put it back under the tree. And uh, the Salvation Army will be around to pick up the gifts. And it's a, a very small window because we didn't want to start prior to Remembrance Day. And they will be picking up the gifts anytime after November the 24th. So that doesn't leave a lot of time. You have to shop wisely and shop quickly. But uh, anyway, it's a good program and we're excited about that. So that's, that's uh, and if you've got any questions, you can ask one of the deacons, Dawn or Elaine or Allison or myself, and Elaine's in the, or, Allison is in the office uh, Tuesday and Thursday mornings if you need to call and ask a question or something. So the date to remember is before November 24th on that one. Uh, the other program, we always uh, have a, a helping hand with the Beacon House Christmas Hamper program. And we're very used to craft dinner. And we started out thinking we were doing craft dinner this year, but we're not. We're doing cranberry sauce. And our donation is to be 100 cans of cranberry sauce. And the deadline for that is December the 1st. So there's your, your two missions before Christmas. And that's it for the ho-ho stuff. Good. Well, then I'll invite Kevin to come and offer the congregational prayer before our, our worship team leads us in another song. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for this day, for the chance to worship you. We praise you, Lord, for who you are, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, our Creator, Lord. Father, today as we re remember uh, those who have served in military capacities, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for our country that we live in. We thank you for their sacrifice, Lord. We even pray, Lord, for those who are still serving. We thank you, Lord, for their dedication, for the great country that we live in, Lord, the fact that we can still worship you freely, that we can still serve you freely, Lord, and we just remember those, Lord, who have given the ultimate sacrifice. Father, we pray this morning for those in our congregation who maybe have a touch of sickness, Lord. We know, Lord, this morning that Erica wasn't able to be able to bring us the message this morning. We pray for her. We pray for healing. We know there are many in our congregation, Lord, that are struggling with sickness. We just ask, Lord, that, that you would be with them, 
that you would heal them where you see fit, that we would remember them, Lord. When people aren't here, Lord, sometimes it's so easy for, for us to kind of forget about them. We just pray, Lord, that you would put them as forefront in their mind. We know, Lord, that many of them would love to be here. Father, we pray this morning for um, those who are involved in the Sunday School program. They're so great, Lord, to see the, the little ones head out this morning. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would be with them, be with the teachers as they bring the gospel to them, Lord. Father, we pray this morning for Pastor Borden. And on short notice, Lord, we know that he's had to prepare his message today. We ask that you would be with him. We know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be guide him and that the words that he will bring will bring honor and glory to you. Father, we have uh, many leaders in our church. We pray for our deacons board, Lord. We pray for those in positions of authority, Lord, that they would uh, always bring honor and glory to you in everything that they do and say. Father, we just ask that you would be with us for the rest of this service. It's so great, Lord, to worship you. We just thank you, Lord, for uh, the ultimate sacrifice as we are in Remembrance Day, and that was your son, Jesus, who died on the cross so that each one here could have opportunity, Lord, to spend eternity with you. Thank you, Lord, once again, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Kevin. Please stand as we sing This Is Amazing Grace. Who brings the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take That you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. 
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. You would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. you've done for me. Amen. Please be seated. There we go. So as you, you heard, uh, Erica fell ill last night, unfortunately, so we pray that She'll recover quickly and not fall behind on uh, her uh, classes and other things. And so we won't be hearing that message today. Maybe in a couple of weeks we, we will. But today instead uh, I'll be looking at uh, Job chapter 3 verses 11 through 26. That's our, our main scripture reference for this morning. So we'll give you a moment if you want to find that in your own Bible or uh, however you access your Bible. And we'll have it on the screen as well. Job 3 starting at verse 11. These, of course, are the words of Job, who has suffered a great loss. He says, Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? For now I would be lying down in peace. I would be asleep and at rest with kings and rulers of the earth who built for themselves places now lying in ruins, with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not hidden away in the ground like a stillborn child, like an infant who never saw the light of day? There the wicked cease from turmoil, and there the weary are at rest. Captives also enjoy their ease. They no longer hear the slave drivers shout. The small and the great are there, and the slaves are freed from their owners. Why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul, to those who long for death that does not come, who search for it more than hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave. Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For sighing has become my daily food, my groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. May God bless to our understanding this reading from His Word. Now, surely one of the biggest questions of life and of faith that is asked by nearly every person of every generation and is debated and answered by many people much wiser than I am over the years is why does God... Let me experience suffering. Why does he put up with all this evil? If God is a loving father worthy of trust, why does he let me experience this suffering? Why do the children of God suffer from terrible illnesses, die in tragic accidents, see their homes destroyed in natural disasters, or fall victim to violence or abuse or theft? Why do tyrants prevail and wars persist? If a good God is running the universe, why are so many people having such a hard time. 
Now, this is a question that we feel right down to the pits of our stomachs. It is much more personal than other God-type questions that we might wrestle with. It's not academic. This is why some people refuse to wrestle with it, why some people even get stuck in bitterness or hopelessness or get crushed under the weight of the feelings that come with experiencing suffering. In exploring this theme this morning, I'm going to first turn to the book of Job, which is dedicated almost entirely to this question, and then certainly we'll also look ahead to the hope found in Christ as we go through. But to start with Job, this is a book of the Bible that I don't think a lot of Christians you know, generally just pick up and read and say, boy, I really want to get my fill of Job today. But for many scholars, uh, you know, religious and non-religious, this is considered to be a literary masterpiece. It's about a man named Job, of course, who was an influential Middle Eastern patriarch, and he had a strong belief in God as he understood him in his time. And Job was very diligent in doing whatever he understood that God wanted him to do, and he was careful in all that he did. He even offered sacrifices on behalf of his children just in case they had done something to offend God. At the beginning of the book of Job, God and Satan have a little discussion. And God points out his servant Job to Satan and says, see, see, this Job guy, he really gets it. He honors me. He obeys me. And Satan's answer is, well, big deal. Of course, he respects you and avoids evil. You've given him everything. You've given him flocks and servants and homes and a large family and good health. I bet as soon as you strip that away, he will curse you to your face. And then God allows Satan the chance to find out. He allows Satan to strip away the blessings of Job's life and cause incredible suffering and misery for him. His flocks and servants are stolen or killed. His children all die in a disaster. Eventually, we find him sitting in the ruins of his house, scraping the painful sores off his body with the broken bits of pottery and debris from what was his home. The only thing that Satan did not take away was Job's wife, which turned out to kind of be a way of adding to his suffering because her unhelpful response to Job's situation was, curse God and die. Good encouragement there, right? But Job's answer to her was more powerful. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. He says, shall we accept good from God, but not trouble? And so in that, he recognizes that he should not only honor God when good things are happening, when he's experiencing blessings, and then reject God the moment his circumstances change. So Job is careful not to curse God for all that's happened, but he is in deep turmoil, he's in pain of every kind. And in the midst of this, Job asks some questions that are found in today's reading. Questions like, why wasn't I just born dead? Why wasn't I just abandoned to die upon birth? Why wasn't I just miscarried in my mother's womb, he wonders. Because his pain is so great that he just wishes he could be at rest. He wishes it could be over that he could be in the grave where he would suffer no longer. And of course, Job's words come to us long before you know, the Christian conception of, of heaven comes to be. And then Job asks a couple more questions. He says, why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul, to those who's, who long for death and it does not come, who search for it more than hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave? Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in. Right? Why are miserable people given life at all? Why are they made to carry on in their suffering when death would be preferable to them, Job asks. And Job cries out from the heart in a way that maybe is familiar to some people here. Because while I hope and pray that certainly, surely no one has lost as much and as quickly as Job does in his story, some of you have had major financial setbacks. Some of you have lost children, and spouses, and close loved ones. Some are facing major health challenges right now. And just about everyone will face these challenges sooner or later. You know, and so will be caused that kind of pain, those, those limitations. In some ways, life is about gradually grieving loss, loss of people, loss of opportunities, loss of our own abilities. You know how hard it can be, perhaps, as Job, to say what Job said. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. So where your own experiences may have led you to some of the same questions that Job asked, we're going to consider a few of his questions. 
The first question is really, it's why me? Why is this happening to me? Job spends a lot of his book defending himself from his friends who come and do a really terrible job of comforting him. (laughs) His friends all show up, and at first they do a great job. They just sit quietly with him. But then as soon as they open their mouths, things go downhill really quickly because they're convinced that Job's suffering is a consequence of his sin. And Job stands firm. He says, no, I have not done anything to deserve this. And God, in fact, agrees with Job about that at the end of the book. But this idea persists even today that suffering must be linked to sin. People assumed it was true in Jesus' day. His disciples saw a blind man and asked Jesus, is he blind because of his sin or his parents' sin? They thought those were the two options. Is he blind because of his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus responded, his blindness was not punishment for anyone's sin, but told them that, in fact, it could serve to glorify God, and then Jesus healed the man to prove it. And so this belief that God operates this way, he inflicts suffering as punishment for our sins, is evidence of a legalistic way of thinking, the kind of thinking that Jesus challenged at every turn. It comes from not really trusting God, that God desires our good, and that he's, maybe He's just waiting to withhold from us or to punish us if we do not appease Him. But a little thought and a little Bible knowledge shows us that this is wrong. It must be wrong. Because the people who obeyed God best in the Bible and pleased Him most were not immune from suffering. In fact, they endured more than anyone else often. The Old Testament prophets were rejected by their people. They were hunted down and killed. The Apostle Paul was stoned and beaten and flogged and shipwrecked and bitten by a poisonous snake. And he had some unnamed illness or challenge that God refused to heal. Jesus was crucified. So we could change our question to, why should Jesus suffer and not me? In fact, this is probably an area where Protestants like us could learn from our Catholic brethren who have more of a theology of suffering, who are able to understand it better as something that might draw us closer to Jesus because it helps us identify with what He's been through rather than assuming it's evidence that something has gone wrong. So that's why me. The second question is, what's the point? For what possible reason would God allow me this suffering? The book of Job gives an answer to this as well, although it's maybe not a very satisfying answer in some ways, because when God first speaks in response to Job, which happens toward the end of the book, he sounds a bit annoyed that Job is questioning him so much. And God reminds Job that God is God and Job is not. Can you make the stars and arrange the heavens according to your will? Can you create the world and fill it with every kind of amazing life? Can you call down lightning and decide where it rains, Job? No? then don't accuse me of wrongdoing or try to correct me or pretend that you understand me and what I do. That's a paraphrase of about three whole chapters of the book of Job. But basically God is saying, look, you don't always get to find out what the reasons are. God tells the prophet Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. You cannot understand the way the universe is unfolding and exactly why you are not God." And Job ends up humbled at the end of this exchange, and he says, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. Now, I would love for this point to be more comforting than that, but really that is what it is. And Job, in fact, did find some comfort in that, because God met with him. The God that he'd only heard of revealed himself. And so God was not uninterested in Job's life or Job's suffering, but God's plan was not necessarily something that he or anyone can understand. God's entitled to run the universe without explaining himself. But on our side of the resurrection of Jesus, we do have promises that God is at work for a good purpose, even if we can't grasp it. One of the best Known of these verses, of course, for Christians is Romans 8, 28, which tells us that in all things God works for good, the good of those who love Him and who have been called according to His purpose. And that purpose is to help each of us who believes in the name of Jesus to become like Him, a process God eventually will complete in His power, but one that we're called to participate in as we live out our earthly lives. 
participation that may require sacrifice and hardship for us, just as it did for Jesus. So why me? What's the point? And the third question is, when will it end? Why is God allowing my suffering to persist? Like the previous question, there's no guarantee of an answer for this. But sometimes we can find partial answers, at least, and blessings from enduring suffering. Job wanted to die in those days of agony, but he ended up with an experience and a direct encounter with God, a faith-strengthening experience, because he endured. And God also blessed Job again afterward. God does restore his fortunes, and then some. Job ends up with you know, wealthier and more blessed than, than he began And he got to experience that restoration and enjoy seeing generations of his family grow and thrive because he was willing to endure through that crushing experience. For those who know and follow Jesus, there are more answers available to us than there were available to Job. Consider 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So if you ever promised that following Jesus would simply make your life smoother and easier, then someone did not know what they were talking about. Better, yes. In many ways, I believe that heart and soul, but easier, no. Now, the wisdom that comes from walking the way of Jesus will help us avoid pitfalls, avoid some hurts and sufferings, some self-inflicted wounds. But the call to serve others, the call to serve on the spiritual front lines against an enemy who wants to undo us, that is not easy. Being a Christian with active faith, being someone on a mission for God invites opposition and requires sacrifices. For the, but the reason that the early followers of Jesus thrived in a hostile environment, they converted an empire and spread the gospel across the world, is that those sacrifices were small compared to the incredible rewards that they trusted in, that they believed in, what was unseen and eternal, which they staked their lives upon. They were disowned by their families. They were fired from their jobs. They were thrown in jail. They were put to death. And they called this light and momentary troubles, which were so utterly outweighed by the inner change they were experiencing and the hope that they had for eternal life. And so they were trading temporary struggles and suffering for unimaginable and eternal glory. So whatever God's reasons were for what they were facing, it hardly mattered compared to the promise that they were pursuing. Now, Christians in much of our world today are paying this same high price willingly. While in Canada, sometimes we're not sure if we can find a few minutes a day to pray or to listen to God, or if we can put up with, you know, putting a little bit in the plate or giving a night or week to a small group or a leadership team at church. It's tough being a Canadian Christian. And that that wasn't sarcasm just now. It is tough being a Canadian Christian because it seems like the stakes are low and that it is safe not to be serious or to never grow up. Now, I hope all of you get the opportunity to see the testimony of a Christian who has grown up enough to suffer well. Someone who experiences peace and strength and trust because of Christ when you'd think that they would easily give in to fear and despair and hopelessness instead. And that's not me. I don't have an example to show in that area. But I've seen examples like that and what a privilege it is. And sometimes I get to speak of those examples to others. My own grandmother was like that. A number that I've ministered to here at Faith Baptist Church have been like that or those who have told me stories of loved ones who were like that. Pastor Scott Sauls reflects on this in a book he wrote called Irresistible Faith, where he writes, Another man from our church whose name is Al was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Young in years, Al faced this devastating news and the decline that would follow with confidence. And I will never forget the day that he and his wife Renee got the news. And a couple of other pastors and I visited that that evening, and we were astounded by Al when he said, 
when I first heard the news, I wanted to ask, why me? But then it seemed that the better question was, why not me? Why not me? The Bible says that God lo loves to manifest His power through our weakness. So he said, I suppose that cancer will be an opportunity for His power to be manifested through me. On my second visit with Al, Pastor Saul says he was wearing a pair of brightly colored striped socks. And when I asked them about them, he told me that they were his happy socks, which he wore as a constant reminder of what is true. That God is a healer and that death and sorrow and sickness cannot ultimately win. And this is the difference that I see in those who know and trust Jesus. They can experience suffering. And while the turmoil and the emotional pain is just as real as for anybody else, they retain hope. They understand that God can work in and through them even in their time of suffering. They believe that nothing they endure in this life will even be worth remembering in the future that God will bring them to. And they look for the ways that God can even use their worst experiences to allow them to be a blessing to others. There is something distinctly Christian about the way that we care about the material and the spiritual simultaneously. And in some religions, you don't have that emphasis. In Eastern mysticism, they're not really sure the material world's really there. And so it's a very different emphasis. In our, our secular world, the material is all we care about. We bury the spiritual so deep underneath it that we don't even necessarily perceive it. And so one would only care about the circumstances and the other perhaps not at all. But Christians care deeply for the suffering now, and we live in hope for the glory later. We see this in Jesus. We see how He healed people. He had compassion on them. He grieved for their suffering, and He healed it, not just as a way to prove His power, but as an overflow of His compassion for them. And yet that was not His ultimate purpose. It was to offer that eternal life and give people hope for that future. We see this in the early church as well, because they operated in a world, in this Roman world, where people who were seen as weak or not particularly useful were disposed of, right? If, that, if a patriarch had a child born in the family, if the child had a birth defect, or if it was just one girl after too many girls, then away, leave it in the woods to die, right? People who were not productive or, or useful were discarded. But then the early Christians came into that world, and they saw each person as an image bearer of God. Not, it was not just about whether they were strong or useful, it was that they were created and bore that very image. And so they rescued those children who were abandoned. They you know, looked after widows. They, they tried to bless and help slaves. They even ministered to those who hated them. And over the years, it was Christians who were opening hospitals and orphanages, uh, you know, making places for those with disabilities, declaring that it is an honor to serve and answer God's call to these kinds of, of people, to those who are vulnerable, for those who are not productive, for those who don't conform. It's not a waste of time. It's not a burden. It's not a waste of resources. It's part of God's call for us. Now, today, there are many organizations and institutions that do a lot of this work as well. But still, there are many forgotten places and cracks in that system where you will find Christians taking up that call. And I think a lot of people in our Western world think that that's just normal, right? That we would care about different people in times of suffering. Even totally people very different from us all the way across the world. When there's a natural disaster, when there's some famine, when there's some awful thing, that we would care and we might do something about that. But it's not normal. It's not natural. It didn't come from nowhere. We wouldn't necessarily have gotten to the place where that matters to us at all if not for the Christian moral imagination on which our culture is still built, even if in many ways we're drifting from it. That call continues today to serve and help those in suffering, whether it's medically or psychologically, those who are disabled, those who've returned from service and experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder or through some trauma in their own lives have come to that place. It's partially on us still to be the ones deciding that we don't ignore those who don't contribute, who cost the system resources for those vulnerable and those who have no voice for themselves, even to care for those who consider us their enemies, and to do so with a passion because their suffering matters in and of itself, 
but also gives us the opportunity to hold out the hope of eternal life and the peace of Christ to them. Now, this can be a hard world to live in at times. But when you live in the knowledge that this is only a tiny part of your story, then you can live differently from someone who can't see past their own fragile life in this temporary world. Jesus said, and part of this was our call to worship, Very truly I tell you, you will meet, weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The takeaway here is not just hang in there, heaven makes it all worth it. The challenge is to live for today with that future in mind. To look to Christ for what you need to endure suffering with grace and hope which is not only a much better experience for you, but also a powerful witness to others. To look to Jesus for what you need to heal so that you can wield your experiences to bless others and fight for them. To reach out through your grief to someone else who's suffering the same thing that you have been through and to love them. To give that gift of trusting God to heal you in the midst of it all. (laughs) Or to rise up from being beaten down to strengthen and support others who are also being abused or oppressed in some way, to do these things because it is right. Show sacrificial love through your gifts of time and talents and resources to help others find the hope that you have in Christ as well. And if you don't feel like your service really costs you something, well, then you must not be giving much. Seek the presence of God. Find peace in a troubled world because Jesus has overcome it. And may we all be some of those people that Jesus uses to overcome some of the pain and the despair and the hopelessness and the injustice that we find around us. Do you join me in a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, we have the example we need in you. You who went to those who were despised, who sought out those who were looked down upon, who invited in children who were considered a worthless bother in that time who, who healed those who could not see and who were, were crippled and then said to them that their sins were forgiven, that you care about the state of our bodies and the state of our souls as well as the state of our world. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just show us any ways that we need to take after you more fully in this, whether it is in serving those who suffer or perhaps in some cases it is growing our faith in our own suffering so that we can not just endure it, but but wield it as a blessing to others. We only get a short time in this world, and you promise us an eternity with with you and and a perfected existence where there's no sad thing now that will even be remembered, no suffering that will even seem noteworthy in comparison to the, the goodness and the glory that is to come. And so I pray that you would help us to endure the present, to thrive in the present, because we rest in our hope of that future. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to come to the Lord's table. And we do call this the Lord's table and not our table because we invite all those who are followers of of Jesus to to participate with us in this today. And this can be an experience that affects us in different ways. Jesus asked us to do this in remembrance of him. And so in part, it is a recognition of of sacrifice, of Jesus' willingness to endure incredible rejection and pain, even to endure time of separation from from his own father. And so we we recognize the, the cost. But in that, we see the depth of his love, that he was willing to pay that cost for you and for me, to win us back from sin and death, to put us on a path of 
of life where Jesus says our joy will be complete and nothing will take it away. So that is part of our remembrance as well. May this be an opportunity for you to seek God, to ask Him to put you back on a path where you should be, uh, to strengthen you from something that you're facing right now, or to, to lift you up and show you someone that, that He has for you to, to love and serve. As we prepare, I'll invite Pam now to offer us a, a reading from the Scripture and a, and a prayer for our experience. Reading this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 17 in the Message Translation. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. So my very dear friends, when you see people reducing God to something they can use or control, get out of their company as fast as you can. I assume I'm addressing believers now who are mature. Draw your own conclusions. When we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? And isn't that the same with the loaf of bread we break and eat? Don't we take into our, ourselves the body, the very life of Christ? Because there is one loaf, our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in him. We don't reduce Christ to what we are. He raises us to what he is. May God add his blessing to the reading of his own word. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we bow before you in humility this morning and ask that you show us anything within us that isn't pleasing to you. Remind us that each time we take communion, Lord, we are to recommit our lives, our hearts, our thoughts, our everything to you. May we always remember that the price you paid at Calvary covers us for all time. You took the pain for us. Thank you, Lord, that your death gave us life, abundant life now and eternal life forever. Now, Lord, we ask your blessing on the bread and on the cup, and just as you instructed your disciples, we too receive these in remembrance of you. Fill us today with your powerful spirit. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You're invited to, to get out and start to lift the crinkly lid of your, your cup. One more bit of uh, COVID our COVID experience as we consider the bread. And that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And in the presence of his disciples, he broke it, telling them that this is my body, which is given for you. I invite you to take and eat. Likewise, the cup after supper, Jesus held that to his disciples, trying to help them understand what was about to happen. They didn't quite grasp it yet. I'm telling them, this is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. I'm trying to help them understand that something new was happening, that he was going to make a way for them to come directly to, to God through him, not through a temple, not through a religious system that in some cases was awfully corrupt, but to know him and to be drawn to God, to be adopted as his child through their faith in him. And so this is Christ's blood shed for us. Take and drink. The Bible tells us that after they, before they went out, they, they sung a hymn. And so our worship team is going to return and lead us in one closing song today. Please stand.
Thank you for the cross, Lord. I started in the wrong key, everybody. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame in the love you came and gave a man. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands washed me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. 